My name is Randy. I'm one of the pastors here. Like I said, I am going to be sharing the word with y'all today. PE is on vacation. Pastor Eric, he will be back soon. Uh, I want to start with a question, all right? I want to start with a question. Maybe you guys have heard uh, some of my, my story before. I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but I definitely did not grow up in the church, and uh, it was kind of weird. I never read the Bible before and went through a lot of stuff in my life, a lot of messy stuff in my life, and uh, for some reason, um, I actually stole, I, I, I stole, quote unquote, I don't know if it's actually stealing, but I borrowed long-term and never returned a Gideon's Bible from a hotel room that I was in at one point in time. And this was like a cheap, like kind of trashy hotel room. I was there by myself. I was uh, all messed up. And I, for some reason, on a whim, grabbed a Bible out of the, the drawer there. I don't even know if they still have Bibles in the hotel drawer. Some places they probably do, uh, maybe in the Bible belt. But I took it and I put it in my, my bag and I, and I actually carried it with me for a long time on my crazy travels. And I never read it <laughs> until one day, I think a couple of years later, I, I cracked the Bible open for the first time in my life. And I was like in my 20s and I started to read it. I didn't know how to read it. I didn't know where to begin. I was like opening it up and I was like, I don't know. I guess I'll start in the beginning, like in the beginning, right? Genesis is in the beginning. Sounds like a good place to start. So if for you guys, uh, I guess the question, you don't have to show your hands, but um, has anybody, when they started reading the Bible for the first time, like try to, to say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read the Bible all the way through. I'm gonna start in the beginning and I'm gonna go from Genesis all the way to Revelation and this is gonna be my mission. I'm gonna read the Bible all the way through. Yeah, I see Ali back there. That was my, that was my big plan. And uh, for the first time ever opening the Bible, let me tell you, I, I got more than I, more than I bargained for. I, I started in Genesis, and Genesis, I, I love Genesis. There's something about like the in the beginning, the majestic, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, right? And the, uh, the Spirit of God is like hovering over the waters kind of a thing. It's very majestic and, and interesting to me. And then Genesis kind of goes on and starts getting into, you know, these crazy stories, the Tower of Babel and Noah, and then you get to like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, like the patriarchs, they call them, of, of the, the Jewish faith. And that's all kind of interesting to me. That's narrative, right? And then you get to uh, Exodus, and Exodus is cool because you're talking about Egypt and Pharaoh and, and the Israelites being oppressed, and God shows up, and Moses, and the plagues, and the parting of the Red Sea. And I can roll with that. That was pretty easy for me. And then I got to Leviticus. <laughs> and when, if you're like me, if you're reading that for the first time, you're like, what is going on here <laughs> in Leviticus? It's all, it's all priestly codes and laws and stuff about like blood and animals and it's full of measurements of this thing they called the tabernacle which was which was basically this temple that they kind of carried around with them in the wilderness I never even heard the word tabernacle before at that point in time in my life I was like what am I reading I felt like I was reading a different language um it, it, it was like, okay, I can push through this. This is my mission. I'm going to get through the Bible from the beginning to the end. So I'm going through Leviticus. I'm going to make it. And if it, Leviticus, like if you, it, for me, at least, I'll speak for myself. The first time, it, it felt like I was coming to like endless chapters about how to diagnose leprosy and what to do if you have house mold. It was crazy. But I made it. <laughs> I made it. I'm like, I got this. I can make it. I made it, finished Leviticus. Woo, there we go. Pat myself on the back. Then I got to numbers. <laughs> uh, numbers, man. I got to be honest here. Uh, Bible plans, I think, often die right there in the desert with the Israelites in the book of Numbers. It's tough. That's a tough one. Um, it literally starts with a solid reading of census data, where it's just, it feels like an ancient phone book full of names I don't know how to pronounce. It's just going for like for genealogies and stuff. It was a whole thing. So for the first time reading it, I was, I was like, where am I? This is crazy. Uh, it's, it's this bunch of genealogies, and then it's, and it's all about, like, these maps and stuff, and it's describing, like, all these locations that I'd never heard of and never really ex knew existed before. Uh, for example, you got, uh, then your border shall change direction from the south to the ascent of Akrabim and continue to Zin, and its termination shall be to the south of Kadesh Barnea, and it shall reach Hazradadar or whatever, and continue to Asmon. And no, that's not Lord of the Rings. That's Numbers 34, verse 4. Right? And I joke, man, I'm kidding. Obviously, I'm kidding because crazy that, that uh, the Lord has a way of like having kind of precious gems and, and, and almost like jewels and gold. You can mine for gold out of any section of the word of God. You really can. It maybe takes a little bit of practice, but there's some 
awesome golden nuggets to be found in all over the place in the word, even the dry areas. And to this day, now I can say like Leviticus is one of my favorite books. I love it. I'm a, maybe I'm a nerd or something, but it's so interesting to me. It's fascinating to me. Numbers is all right. <laughs> Numbers is okay. Uh, but it has its moments, but that's how scripture works, right? Scripture is living and active, the Bible says. The author of Hebrews says it's living and active, the word of God. There's all kinds of life in the scriptures. Um, as a pastor, I don't like to recommend people because I get people come to me all the time and they're like, hey, I'm, you know, maybe I give them a Bible for the first time or something and I hand them one and they're like, well, where do I begin? And I'm always thinking about myself like back in the day. I'm like, I don't want them to get trapped in Leviticus and Numbers and, and get discouraged and close it and put it away, right? So I tell them, hey, let's start in the New Testament. Let's start with a gospel. So I'll recommend like, hey, start, start with a gospel of Luke or something and maybe after Luke go into Acts because it's written by the same guy. So you get the gospel and then it kind of goes into the, the birth of the church and the church was like a wee little baby and how it kind of grew up and took over, you know, all kinds of nations and kind of grew over the entire world. So Luke and Acts. But let me ask a quick bit of trivia. Uh, Luke is not the first, this is easy, the first gospel in the New Testament. What's the first book of the New Testament? Matthew, right? So Matthew is, is a great book. I love Matthew. But it was, it's kind of funny because I was going through all the Old Testament and struggling with the genealogies and struggling with the maps. And I'm like, oh, wow, the New Testament, here we go. And page one, it's Matthew. Verse one is genealogies. <laughs> so let's, let's just read it right here because I want to I take a moment because we're going to show how even sometimes a, a place that can be a difficult overlooked or even a skippable section of the Bible can have some real gems and amazing things that are in there. So let's, let's read for a second. And bear with me because we're going to get to some stuff here, but it's going to be a, you know, a genealogy. So Matthew chapter one, this is the first verse of the New Testament. If you're like, I'm going to start reading the New Testament. This is what you come off first. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and then you start getting into the begots. Abraham begots Isaac. Does anybody say begot? Well, Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. That's the first woman. Perez begot Hezron and Hezron begot Ram. Ram had a guy named Aminadab that sounds like a blood pressure medication. Uh, ask your doctor today about Aminadab. It does. It does. I know it does. You're going to go away and be like, that totally sounded like a blood pressure medication. Yeah. Anyway, Aminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz. It goes for a long time. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, etc. Right? So it's like, that's the first block. And it goes on. There's a lot more names in there. That was like the first kind of five or six verses I wanted to, I wanted to just kind of highlight and the reason I want to highlight that is because there's a lot going on there. There's a reason that Matthew kicks off his entire gospel with this thing to modern readers. There's something, I'm honest, honestly, it's, it's very skippable in our modern eyes sometimes. I know I'm guilty of sometimes being like, all right, so where does it actually start? Because I don't want to go through all these names that I can't pronounce. Aminadab. But there's all kinds of good stuff that's there. So we want to explore today, and we're going to mine for a couple of those precious gems. And uh, really, we see from the start here, this genealogy, what Matthew's trying to do is he's trying to prove that Jesus is in line for the throne of Israel, right? So it's like a big deal back in the day, your blood, what your bloodline was, what your family line was, right? You get this in all the nations of the ancient world. You get this in Egypt where it was like dynasties and families that would have the throne and be the Pharaoh. And sometimes they would, they would even do crazy stuff to try to supposedly keep their bloodline pure where they'd run out of like other people to marry. So they just started to marry each other, their brothers and sisters. And then it'd be like the Pharaoh and his wife and they'd have children and eventually that didn't work out too well for them. But this is what the ancients would do. It was all about your bloodline, who your family was, who were you on the outside. And Israel in a way was, was no different. There was the line of King David. And this is really the genealogy that's going to show that from King David, even from Abraham, all the way through King David, all the way down to Jesus, that Jesus is an heir to the throne of Israel. He qualifies to be the Messiah of Israel that they've been waiting for. 
That's a lot, but it's right at the start. He's showing this for his readers, his Jewish readers, that Jesus is the one that fulfills. He fulfills the requirements. So mining for gems, right? Let's say the first one that Matthew's got going on here, the first gem we're going to talk about. Matthew is telling us that Jesus is the beginning of a new creation, Right there in that genealogy we just read, that verse 1, it says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Let's show that on the screen. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Yep, right there. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew uses this on purpose because he's actually calling back. We don't know unless we mine a little bit, unless we dig a little bit. But he's calling back, and his readers are knowing that when he says the book of the genealogy of Jesus, he's making a comparison to somebody else in the Old Testament there, where it talks about in Genesis 5, the book of the genealogy of Adam. Back there in the Old Testament, it's got Adam, and then it goes on through all these names of all of his descendants. So Matthew is on purpose, starting with Jesus. This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus. So he's got a comparison. He's got Adam, and he's got Jesus. And we know that in the Bible, Adam is associated with a couple of things that are not pleasant things. He's got sin and death that he's associated with. Adam is associated with sin and death. But Jesus, of course, is associated with forgiveness and life. So Matthew's making that comparison. Jesus is the first in line of a new creation. In Adam, all of his descendants, according to the flesh, they all died. But Jesus didn't have physical fleshly descendants. What he has are children by faith, by something else. Those who are in Adam will die, and they all did die, but those who are in Jesus will live forever. And in a way, Matthew is telling us that there's something even going on in our own very selves, because I know for myself that I am not who I once was. I'm not the same guy who was running around on the streets, staying in cheap motels, hanging out with all kinds of trouble, getting myself into endless, endless terrible situations, lying and cheating and stealing and doing whatever that I was doing because I was doing the dirt. But I am not who I once was. I'm not who I once was. In fact, I am a new creation. I am a new creation in Jesus. It's no longer about who I am in the flesh and the blood. It's no longer about where I come from or what I've done or even what I look like. It's about who Jesus is in me that matters. And you guys, many of you, maybe not everyone, my hope is that everyone, but many of you know that yourselves. You know that for yourself in your own lives. You are not who you once were. That God has brought you new life and has delivered you from that old life that is now dead in the grave because you have been risen and resurrected and new with Christ. Amen. It's not about who we are according to the flesh anymore. Like I said, it's not about what you look like. That's the world's way. Okay, that's the world's way. The world's way is to judge you by what you look like. Look at the influencers, right? They don't often get like, you know, ugly influencers. They're looking for the pretty people, right? The valuable, the value comes from the looks. The value comes from maybe what family you're from or your financial status or how many cars you got or whatever. Maybe how many children you got or something like that. Value according to the world is based on surface issues. It's based on surface issues. That's the old way of doing things. That's the world's way of doing things. But the world's ways are passing away. Now, I want to illustrate that point a little bit, that the world loves to look and judge on the surface, right? There was, a psych- there was some psychologists, a team of psychologists that did a study, and they, were, they wanted to, to prove that they could get the people that they, were, that they were doing this experiment on, that they could get the people to vote for whoever that they wanted them to vote for, and it wouldn't be based on the, the, the issues of the day, but it would be merely based on looks. 
So they took two pictures and they had, in, they had in mind, you know, two different pictures and like one would be like slightly better put together maybe or more of a conventional, handsome or, or, or beautiful look to them. So they took these two candidates. They did it actually with, with, with two men and two women, these, these, these pictures. And they would alternate. They would say like, let's talk about the woman first. Okay, so the one over here that is like more put together or whatever, looking more put together, she in this situation is a hardcore liberal Democrat. And the one who doesn't look as put together is the conservative Republican. Who are the people going to vote for if you just... If you just had, you know, 100 people and you polled them, who are they going to be more likely to vote for? If it's split 50-50 between Democrats and Republicans, who are they going to vote for? And these psychologists were like, yeah, I bet they vote for whoever looks better on the surface. So they polled the people, and what happened? The people voted for the more attractive person. So then they said, okay, we're going to switch pictures, but we're going to keep the issues, right? So now who was formerly the picture, who was formerly the, the, the liberal Democrat was now a conservative Republican. They switched the pictures and they pulled new people and they said, okay, now what's going to happen? Who are they going to vote for? And all of a sudden, now the crowd was overwhelmingly conservative Republicans because it wasn't so much about the issues that they stood for, and it listed all the issues that they supposedly stood for. The people didn't so much care about the issues. They cared about what they saw on the surface. You know politicians know that, right? Yeah. And it's crazy because that's the world's way of doing things, but God's way of doing things isn't looking at the surface anymore. It's actually looking at the heart, what's going on on the inside. Galatians 3 says it like this. It says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. If you just saw a picture of somebody, can you tell if they have faith? You can't. Can you say, well, that person's got faith. Just by a picture, you can't tell. You can't tell. But this says, in Christ, you are all children through faith. That's who you are. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free nor male nor female. And that's about position. Because those three, the slave and the Gentile and the woman, were actually considered second-class citizens of back in the day. And Jesus is saying that in me, by faith, faith, there's no more positional game like that where there's a first class citizen, which is the men or the Jew or the wise, but it's about him leveling the ground. It's about what's going on on the inside. That's who you are. If you have faith in Christ, you're a child of God. That's your higher identity. You're clothed with Christ. It says you're clothed with Christ. It's like you're covered up with Christ. That we have to identify with Jesus and who he is even more than we identify with ourselves. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm married to a Colombian woman. She was born and raised in Colombia. She's very proud to be Colombian. I've been down to Colombia. I am very clearly not a Colombian. I would walk down the streets in Bogota, Colombia, and people from like a block and a half away would be pointing like it's an alien. It was obvious to me, to them, that I was not a Colombian. I was clearly an American, really. And it actually shocked me because here there's Latinos all over the place and everybody kind of mixes in. Down there, it was like zero gringos, zero. <laughs> Stuck out like a sore thumb. Super awkward. <laughs> but I may identify myself as an American. My wife might identify herself as a Colombian. You might be Venezuelan or Ghanaian or Chinese or Korean or whatever. However, that we may be on the surface is not as important as who we are on the inside. Even those things like being American or Colombian or Chinese, whatever, that all has to come. Our identities, our personal identities have to come second because we are now clothed in Christ first, wrapped in Christ first. That brings me to our second little jewel that we're mining out of that genealogy. And it's that Matthew's trying to show us something, He's trying to show us something here. And it's that the kingdom of God is not about flesh and blood. 
Christ's kingdom is not about, is not like earthly kingdoms. Earthly kingdoms rise and fall. What was a huge empire, world covering empire at one point in time is no longer. They have risen and fallen. Christ's kingdom endures forever. Nobody's talking about the Hittites or the Ottoman Empire. Nobody barely remembers the the Roman Empire. All those emperors are dead and gone. All the kings of the earth and the mighty and the rich and powerful from back in the day, even if their fame covered the earth like Nebuchadnezzar or somebody, they are all dead and back in the dust, buried. Christ's kingdom is not an earthly kingdom that will ever fade away. It's a heavenly kingdom that will last forever. What's of the earth passes away. 1 Corinthians 15 says it like this. What I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies, this is a super uncomfortable truth. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. The uncomfortable truth is that we are all faced with our own mortality someday. That this, what we see and what we are on the outside is not the end all be all. This will actually change someday. We will, we will actually in a way like shed our bodies. We are spirit beings. The New Testament talks about our bodies almost like a tent. It refers to our bodies as a tent. Like the idea that like there's a spirit being inside of me and it's carrying around this body like a tent. And wherever I go, that tent has been put down for a little while. And if I start walking again, now you put the tent over here kind of a thing. And it says that one day that tent is going to be folded up and put away. And all that's left is going to be what was on the inside. And what was on the inside was hopefully faith in Christ. Because what flesh and blood cannot do, inheriting the kingdom of God, he can do through his miraculous power to transform us into something beyond this existence. But the question is, do we have faith? Do we know him? And does he know us? Because it can't just be a thing that's just like, yeah, that's probably going to happen. That's cool. I'm, I'm with that. I went to church a couple times, whatever. Yeah, that's cool. I'm sure. Whatever he said. It can't be like that. It can't be like that. It's not about what you've done, who you are, where you came from. It's not about those things. It's about faith in Jesus Christ that makes us children of God. That is like Bible 101. That is the first thing that we got to know in the New Testament. Faith in Jesus Christ is what makes us children of God. Paul says to be away from these earthly bodies is to be at home with the Lord. But do we know the Lord? So the third precious stone, and this is the good news, the third precious stone we're going to mine here out of the genealogies is the fact that outsiders are welcome in the kingdom of God. Outsiders are welcome in the kingdom of God, the family of God. God was including the outsiders from the beginning. Even though the story of God, if you start in Genesis and you're getting there to Exodus and stuff, it seems like the story of God starts in a Jewish bubble. But the intention was not that it would remain that way forever. The Lord is too big to keep inside of a bubble. He's all-encompassing. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. Outsiders are welcome in the family of God. So we definitely see some outsiders in that genealogy. We definitely see that. There's actually women in that genealogy. And you're like, you know, if you're like me and you're modern, you're like, well, there should probably be women, right? Should be. It takes, you know, there's man, birds and the bees kind of a thing. And they have, you know, I have a five-year-old at home. We have a seven-year-old is like a little bit smarter. It's like, uh, I don't know how to navigate these waters. Where do babies come from? Do you still believe in the stork? I... <laughs> To us, it's like, well, it makes all the sense in the world that there's women in these genealogies. But back in the day, honestly, women were second-class citizens. They were second-class citizens. It was was all about the men and the fathers and their sons, and the sons would take over the household when when the fathers died. 
And a lot of times women would pass from household to household and it's just the way that it was because it was about the blood of the father in the son. You know this even from like, what is it, Henry VIII and some of these kings, they would, they would, some of these brutal people would kill their wives if their wives were not supplying them with male heirs. That's terrible. It's terrible. So by including women in these genealogies way back then, Matthew was trying to get our attention. Because a quick trivia question would be, how many women do you think are in that super long genealogy of Adam back there in Genesis? Because the answer is zero. Or how many women do you think are in Luke's gospel when he lists the genealogy leading down to Jesus? How many women do you think are in that genealogy? The answer is, again, zero. But Matthew's got like five. And when you start to scratch the surface and mine a little bit deeper in that, what he's doing there, you start to ask yourself, well, why these women? Because if you were going to be expecting a woman to be in the genealogy, why not like a famous one? Not, why not like if you have Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who are like the patriarchs? Why would you not have their wives like their matriarchs? Sarah, right? Sarah believed that she was going to have a baby when she was like 90 years old. And that's a big deal. How come she is now one of the women in the genealogy? What about Isaac's wife, Rebecca? Or maybe Jacob's wife, Rachel? Why are those matriarchs not in there? Why are we getting people like Tamar and Rahab and Ruth? Why we got women in the boys club? And why are they such oddball choices? So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna dive into this. First, we have this woman, Tamar. Tamar. We read about her in the beginning when I was reading that genealogy. She was apparently with Judah. Now, you probably have heard of Judah before. Maybe you've never heard of Tamar before. Judah, they even still sing songs that have his name in it, right? Like the Lion of Judah. You maybe heard, I'm sure, He's got a famous name to this day. He's one of the rock stars, one of like the heroes of the faith in a way. Judah was the man. Everybody knows Judah, but Tamar? And then we start to scratch the surface and mine a little bit deeper. Well, who is this Tamar? And we find her story in Genesis 38, and we start reading that, and it's like, whoa, this is a doozy of a story. Why are you putting this in the genealogy? Why, why is this woman in the genealogy, Matthew? What are you doing, man? You should have gone with Sarah. Sarah's the safe choice. Back in the day, I told you that women were second-class citizens. Well, one of the things that would happen back in the day, there was a law. And uh, ladies, I'll ask you if this is something that, that, uh, that sounds great to you, because I'm sure it doesn't. But if you were married to a man and you didn't have children and that man died, you would actually pass to the brother of that man and become his wife. And then if that man died, you'd pass to his brother and become his wife. And that was the way that it was back in the day. Because you have to remember that a woman's value was derived oftentimes purely based on the children that they were providing the family. And if you were not providing children to the family, what value did you have? If you were barren, you might as well have been dead in those cultures. So this woman, Tamar, is never married to Judah. In actuality, Tamar is married to one of Judah's sons. And she's married to one of his sons, and his son dies while she's married to him. She doesn't have any children. So she passes like property to the next son. And then he dies, and she still has no children. And Judah's looking at the third son that he has, and she's looking at the third son that he has, and they're both like, what's going to happen here? And Judah decides, that chick is cursed. There ain't no way I'm giving her my third son to marry her. It pretty much says that. Genesis 38, 11. Judah says to his daughter-in-law Tamar, hey, live as a widow in your father's household until my third son grows up because he's thinking he might die too, just like his brothers. So Tamar goes and lives in her father's household. And in that culture, you are now damaged goods. Ain't nobody gonna come run to your rescue and be like, hey, I'm gonna marry you. And nobody's gonna do that. She is now cut off and alone, living in her father's house with no children, no prospects. 
valueless in her society and alone. Tamar, considered useless. So she devises a plan. She sees that this law is not being followed. She sees that she's being stuck forever by herself, that there's no hope for her, that Judah's not given that third son to her, that she has no hope for a family, no hope for value. So she devises a desperate plan. Verses 13 and 14, when Tamar is told one day, hey, your father-in-law Judah, he's on his way somewhere to shear his sheep. So she says, okay, this is my chance. She takes off her widow's clothes, puts on different clothes. She disguises her face with a veil. She goes and sits along the way to where she knows her father-in-law Judah is going. And as he's going by, he sees her and thinks that she's a prostitute. So he says, let me sleep with you. Let me sleep. Matthew, why this woman? <laughs> When Judah saw her in verse 15, he thought she was a prostitute because she had covered her face, not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law. And he went over to her by the roadside and said, come now, let me sleep with you. She says, well, what are you going to give me? And he's like, I don't got money on me right now, but what I do have is going to be a placeholder. They call it a pledge. He says, I'm going to take off my signet ring. It's basically my signature. And I'm going to let you have this as a placeholder until I send the money to you later. So you can take my special signet ring, this authentic one-of-a-kind signet ring, and I'm going to give you my staff. And I'm going to send the money, and you give those back when the money shows up. And she says, all right, deal. So they sleep together. Judah goes his way, goes along his way back home. He sends the money up there and he starts asking around. He's like, hey, where's that prostitute that was here before? Where was she at? And they're like, uh, what prostitute? There's never been a prostitute around here. And he's thinking, okay, like somebody just stole my ring and my staff. All right. And now comes the turn in the story. A couple months later, Somebody comes running up to Judah. Judah, 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 listen, man. Your daughter-in-law Tamar has been sleeping around and playing the prostitute, and now she's pregnant. And Judah, Mr. Rockstar, Mr. Old Testament, we still sing about this guy in songs to this day. He's still mentioned. This guy, let's pick it up in verse 24. Three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. And Judah says, bring her out here and have her burned to death. Matthew, what the heck are you doing, man? What a guy this Judah is, right? What a guy. What a guy. And the big reveal comes in verse 25. As she's being brought out to be killed, she sent a message to her father-in-law. She says, yeah, I am pregnant. I'm pregnant by the man who owns these things and shows the signet ring and shows the staff that belonged to Judah. And he sees them things and recognizes them. And all the wind comes out of his sails. <laughs> He's like, oh, boy. <laughs> he says, she is more righteous than I am since I wouldn't give her to my third son and he did not sleep with her again. In a way, Judah repents there and is like, I was wrong, she is right. And Tamar is free to go. And she has twins and that lands in the genealogy of Jesus. Talk about a messy story. Talk about a complicated story. And what Matthew is showing us, that even the complicated and the messy parts of life, the messy things of life, the messy people in life, have a place at the dinner table of the family of God. Because life itself is messy. If you think that was messy, wait till we get to the next woman that Matthew puts in the genealogy. <laughs> because if Tamar dabbled as a prostitute, the next woman actually was a career prostitute, 100%. What's going on, Matthew? Why are you putting these ladies in here? This is Rahab. We know her story from the story when the Israelites are conquering this city called Jericho. 
and they're getting ready to conquer this city, and they send in some spies to check it out. How, what's the best way to conquer this city? And they end up in this prostitute's house. No comment. I don't know. It doesn't say why they ended up there. They just ended up there. And the king of Jericho finds out that these spies are in his city, and he knows where they're at. He knows that they're with Rahab, the prostitute, so he sends soldiers to go get them and kill them because he knows that they're up to no good. And the soldiers come to the door of Rahab, the prostitute. Where are those two spies? How many spies that were here? Where are they at? And Rahab does the cartoon thing and is like, this way? And they go off. The soldiers go off looking for these spies and they never find them because they're still there in her household and she's hidden them. And she turns to these spies, these Israelites. She's not an Israelite. She's from Jericho. She's a pagan, a Canaanite. She's their natural enemy according to the flesh and blood. And she turns to these spies and she says, I know the Lord is with you. And I know, we know what the Lord has done for your people already. And by doing this kindness for you, I ask that you would do this kindness for me in return. That you would spare my family and myself when God delivers this city to you. As I spared your lives when they came looking to kill you. I have saved you in faith, basically, is what she's saying. Now save me. She goes on to make what's called the Hall of Faith. It's like the Bible's version of the Cooperstown Baseball Hall of Fame. You go to the Baseball Hall of Fame, and you're like, okay, there's Ted Williams. He's got like an exhibit and all this stuff. And then you go, okay, Babe Ruth, and you're looking at that exhibit. Oh, cool. Find out all about Babe Ruth. And you can go through all these exhibits and read all about these guys who are in the Hall of Fame for baseball. Well, the Bible has that, and it's in Hebrews chapter 11, and it's all the big wigs, all the famous faith movers from the Bible. And it lists them all off and tells like their stories and stuff. It's like Gideon and Barak and Abraham and all these people and Rahab. The prostitute, the pagan prostitute, has her own section, has her own little exhibit in that Hebrews chapter 11, Hall of Faith. So interesting. Hebrews eleven thirty one. 31, by faith, the prostitute Rahab did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And if we're astute, if we're astute here, if we know our Bible and we scratch the surface even a little bit more, we find out it's the reason that Rahab is in that genealogy is because she married what appears to be one of the spies. And they had a child, a son named Boaz, who you might know from another Bible story called a Bible book called Ruth. And Boaz is this merciful man who redeems a woman named Ruth, who was an outsider and a Gentile and a widow and valueless according to the society at large. And Boaz redeems and has mercy on Ruth because his mother taught him what it meant to have mercy and be just and be a real man. A prostitute who knew about being mistreated by men taught her son how to treat a woman right. Do you hear what Matthew is doing? This is crazy. It's so complicated and messy. But it's such a story of sin and redemption and the grace of God that your past does not have to define you, that you don't have to be a, a well-known name like a Judah or a David. You can be broken and still be brought into the family of God. Maybe some of y'all are dealing with some brokenness in your lives today. Without Rahab, there's no Ruth. There's no book of the Bible named Ruth if it wasn't for Rahab. And the fourth woman that is in the genealogy is interesting, and I, I'm going to move carefully into this one. The fourth woman is not even mentioned by name. 
It says that David had a son by her who had been the wife of Uriah. He doesn't even name her by name. We know her name from the Bible story. Her name was Bathsheba. But he doesn't name her by name. It just says her of Uriah. And I believe that Matthew's doing that on purpose because he's trying to draw attention to the fact that David, the hero of the faith, David, David, the man after God's own heart, David, David had done something terrible and had stolen the wife of one of his closest allies, one of his loyalist, most loyal soldiers. Not only did he steal her from him behind his back, but then he had this loyal soldier killed to cover it up. To cover up the fact that he had gotten her pregnant behind his back. David was the one on the rooftop when he saw her. David was the one that sent soldiers to her house when her husband wasn't home and had her come back to his palace. David was the one who set those things into motion. King David, of whom there are many, many songs written, a hero in the faith, but Matthew is trying to show us that even our heroes are flawed. He is bringing the high a little lower and he's bringing the low a little higher to show that in Jesus is not about who you are in the flesh and the blood. It's about who we are and who's living inside of us. If that was done in the church, that would be abuse. If I was like some like, major mega pastor or whatever of some church and I was like grooming women in the crowd and using my power and authority or whatever to try. That's abuse. It doesn't even matter if she says yes. That's abuse. It's an abuse of a power dynamic and it's an abuse of authority. God-given authority given to people. That is abuse. So David did commit a terrible sin and Matthew is showing that. And he's using these women to mar, dabbled as a prostitute, Rahab, full-on prostitute. Ruth, a Gentile outsider, widow, and Bathsheba. And he's using these four women to tell a story. And the story is that outsiders are welcome into the family of God and that we might have messy and complicated pasts full of brokenness, but God, but God. So there's this, there's this, there's this ancient Japanese art. You may have heard of it before. I'm probably going to pronounce it wrong. But it's, I believe it's called kintsugi. We're not going to show the picture just yet. It's called kintsugi. We'll show the picture anyway. <laughs> Let's take it off. We'll come back to it. We'll pretend that didn't go up. Hi. <laughs> So the ancient Japanese art called kintsugi, it's where they repair broken vessels, something that was shattered or chipped or broken, and they don't just leave it for dead. They actually repair it, and they don't try to disguise the fact that it was once broken. Like, you can take that white bowl. Fine, let's put it that white bowl. Let's do it. You could take that white bowl and you could repair it with like a white enamel and maybe get it to the point where people would never even know that it had been broken. But this art form and the beauty of this art form is that they incorporate the former brokenness. They don't try to hide it. And they use gold to seal and mend and bring that pottery back to what it once was. It's not exactly as it once was. It's been through some things. It's called the art of precious scars. I think Jesus is a little bit like that kind of an artist who specializes in taking what was broken and shattered
who specializes in knowing the deepest wounds of our hearts, the things that we've passed through, the things that we've done in our past, the wreckage and the carnage of life, because life is just, life happens. But Jesus is this great artist that knows how to heal and knows how to put together what was once broken. He doesn't need to hide that brokenness. He's got a way of making it even more beautiful by incorporating it into this new creation that he has made. So if you've been through some brokenness in your life, maybe broken relationships where you you just felt shattered. Or there was no way to mend a relationship and you lost it. And you felt judged and you felt guilty about it. And maybe you were scarred by it. Or maybe you were going through a season in your life where you were born into a situation where you were broken from the beginning or someone broke you on purpose. I just want to tell you that you can trust in the Lord. You can hope in the Lord and allow him to put you back together even better. Maybe someone told you love was something that it really wasn't. And it hurts you deeply. And there's scars that people can't see because it's in their scars. They're not even on the surface. They're deeper than the surface. And you carry them. But the Lord knows. And he wants to touch those too. If he can heal me and my incredible brokenness, and I'm still, <laughs> I think I'm still being put together. Trust in him today. You may have been scarred and broken, but you have to remember that there's no need for that to define you. Your past doesn't have to hold you back that in the Lord and Christ, we are all children by faith. There are no second-class citizens in the kingdom of heaven. He died for you. He lived and loved for you. He still lives and loves you. In Christ, all things are made new, new beginnings, mercy new every day. It doesn't depend on your family, your social status, where you've been or what you've done. That's by faith. Maybe today we have to be a little bit more like Matthew. Maybe we're being called to remember the outsiders and make sure that they know that there's a place for them at the dinner table of the family of God. That's not just for those who have it all together because the truth is those who seem like they have it all together don't. I just want to pray. Father, thank you that your love is so great and amazing, Lord. And you're so gentle and merciful, God, that you... You see our hearts. You know our innermost thoughts and wounds that we carry, Lord. Everybody's got wounds, Lord. I just pray that you bring your healing touch, Lord. We won't be able to forget the things that we've been through. But at least in a way, even inwardly, if it's only inwardly, we can boast in who you are because of how you've put us back together in spite of what we've gone through. Thank you, Lord, that you are our healer, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord, do your work, God. 
your healing work. Amen.